Questions oral. Oral questions. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, it's clear Canadian drone systems were diverted to the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan in violation of the Arms Trade Treaty, the Wassenaar Arrangement and Canadian law. There's lots of reputable photographic and video evidence. Here's what we know. On April 23rd, the Prime Minister spoke with Turkish President Erdogan. In that conversation, did he agree to President Erdogan's request to approve the export of these drone systems from Canada to Turkey? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, as I think everyone in the House knows, our government is committed to a strong and rigorous arms export system. That is why we acceded to the Arms Trade Treaty. Human rights considerations are now at the centre of our exports regi regime. Uh, when we became aware of uh, possible uh, uses of uh, military equipment that had been exported to Turkey, uh, the Minister immediately ceased uh, export permits, suspended them, and uh, they are now under review. View at this time. Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Madame la, le, la Présidente. Madam Speaker, the government didn't answer my question. The export of these weapons is contributing to the conflict. So let me ask this simple question. Did the government did the government listen to Erdogan and ask public servants to export these drones, yes or no? Uh. Madam Speaker, with all due respect, I, I believe I did answer the question that we are committed to a rigorous arms uh, export regime. Uh, we follow uh, all our, our, our international commitments and even more uh, by legislation passed by this House of Commons. Uh, everything that we do with respect to our arms treaties, uh, our arms exports are following international law and we are subject to no undue pressure from any external forces. Thank Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Madame la Présidente, cela fait près de dix. Madam Speaker. For nearly ten months, the victims of the downing of the Ukrainian flight have been asking for answers. When will the government take action and sanction those responsible? And listen to the democratic will of this House and impose sanctions on the Iranian regime, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Parliament, uh, the Honourable Minister. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, and I, I, I want to acknowledge to the, to the member opposite and to this House that, that we are very concerned with the activities of various hostile state actors um, as it pertains to their, their activities around human rights and their impact on Canadians. We are rigorously reviewing constantly the, 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 the criminal legislation that allows for the, the, uh, the, the, the listing of, of certain organizations. And with respect to the particular regime he refers to, we have, in fact, listed a number of their proxies um, as, as terrorist organizations. We'll continue to act in the best interest of the safety of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Well, Madam La uh, Madame Speaker, not only has the government failed to not impose sanctions in regard to the downing of this Ukrainian airliner that killed so many Canadians, the families are now being re-victimized. People like Hamid Esmailian of Richmond Hill are being threatened, bullied, and harassed by the Iranian regime right here in Canada. When will the government take seriously the threat of foreign influence operations run here in this country by Iran, by China, and by Russia? When will it get serious and use the full power of the government of Canada to shut these operations down? Good the Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I agree completely that any, any activity directed towards the families of the, the victims of that terrible tragedy in the Danny, uh, the, that, that airline is, is outrageous and unacceptable. I want to assure the member opposite that the National Security Establishment and our law enforcement agencies are, are vigorously engaged on that, that issue. We will do what is necessary to protect those individuals, and we share in, in the member's denunciation of that activity on Canadian soil. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. 
Madam Speaker, uh, two months ago, Russia used the chemical weapon Novichok to poison opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Two years ago, Russia used that same chemical weapon to poison people in the UK, one of whom died. Two weeks ago, Europe and Britain imposed sanctions on Russian officials for the poisoning of Navalny. This government says it believes in multilateralism, but when given the opportunity, often does not act accordingly. When will this government join our allies and impose Magnitsky sanctions on Russian officials responsible for the poisoning of opposition leader Navalny? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, uh, I, I believe the member knows that Canada has strongly condemned and will continue to condemn the attack against Alexei Navalny, who has been poisoned with a chemical nerve agent, and we thank Germany for its steadfast support for him through this process. We strongly condemn this outrageous attack. Uh, Russian authorities have to explain what happened so that those responsible may be held to account without delay. The use of chemical weapons is abhorrent and unacceptable. Canada joins the international community and will continue to stand with Mr. Navalny and his family in the search for justice and for... Honorable Deputy de Manicouagan. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Ms. Madam Speaker, the government has finally tabled a report to explain why it prorogued Parliament during the summer. But even after reading the report, I still don't know why the government acted this way. We don't know why the period lasted six weeks instead of a, a single day. If it was really just to reimagine a parliament business to the pandemic, and we don't know why it took six weeks to create a throne speech that was practically the same as the last budget. I can't remember. Can the government remind me what happened on the 18th of August when it decided to shut down Parliament? Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. You know, since day one, this government, this Prime Minister, its focus has been combating the coronavirus pandemic. We have put in a, a multitude of different programs that have really had a positive impact on all Canadians in all regions. We prorogued the session because it was very important that all of us remain focused and co work collaboratively on on doing what Canadians want us to do, and that is to put in our best efforts in fighting the coronavirus. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member, Madam Speaker, when things are urgent, you don't take six weeks, you take 24 hours. That's it. The problem with the report is that there are two missing words in it. We charity. The Liberals forgot to say that it was very convenient to suspend the work of four committees that were investigating the Liberal scandal. They forgot to explain that what they wanted was to gain six weeks in which we wouldn't hear about We Charity. And once again, the government is trying to bog down committees that are investigating the scandal. Why isn't the government honest enough to admit that it suspended Parliament because of We Charity? Madam Speaker, the House of Commons, for the first time since 1988, sat during July and August. We actually sat more days in the summertime than we actually lost through the prorogation. Now, I know members of the opposition might say, well, technically we didn't sit as a House of Commons, but we all sat on the floor of the House of Commons. There were literally hundreds of questions, opportunities for all opposition party to hold the government to account. So the reality of it, Madam Speaker, is we will continue to be focused on combating the coronavirus. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Madam Speaker, Logan's, a longtime live music venue in Victoria, announced that this week that it had to shut its doors for good. Logan's was a beloved watering hole where people came together to talk politics, listen to live music, and go to the Sunday Hootenanny. I have heard from countless small businesses just like Logan's who are struggling to stay open, and Victoria is facing the impending loss of many of the places that make our community what it is. Logan's will be missed. We need to support these small businesses. Why are small businesses like Logan still waiting on this government to give them the kind of help that would keep them afloat? Barry. Thank the member for, for raising the issue about that local live venue and the importance of this venue. Uh, by their ongoing compliance with public health guidelines, Canada's theatres, live venues have been doing their part to keep Canadians safe from the pandemic, but these cancellations have had an impact on the businesses. We recognize the importance 
of, of ensuring the viability and that we have a strong, robust industry. And we have committed through emergency funds $500 million to help maintain jobs and support this business community. We will continue to be there and continue to work for a robust recovery, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. Madam Speaker, Canada had a severe housing crisis before the outbreak of COVID-19, but due to the severe economic impacts of the pandemic, many more Canadians are at risk of losing their homes. They need their federal government to help. Yet, in my riding of Vancouver Kingsway, an agency of this government is ordering the Still Creek Co-op to raise its rents by over 5%. Will the Liberals instruct the CMHC to cancel this policy that will hurt many single parent families, low income individuals, disabled folks? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you very much for that question. This government, through the National Housing Strategy, has actually restored lapsed uh, uh, funding agreements with co-ops to sustain this, the rent geared income program that the Conservative government was letting uh, disappear under their watch. Uh, the individual in question, the, the co-op in question, I'd be happy to sit with the member to, to review what CMHC has done around re-establishing those subsidies. But uh, in response to COVID, this government has now taken the unprecedented step of launching the Rapid Housing Initiative, a $1 billion initiative to acquire and renovate and provide emergency emergency housing immediately for, 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 for cities across this country, and we look forward to continuing to work with the Parliament to, to achieve on this file. Honorable Deputy de Louis Saint Laurent. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Unfortunately, Canada is the country in the G7 with the highest unemployment rate. And Canada is the only country in the G7 without an economic recovery plan. Unfortunately, Canada's government doesn't seem to know what to do with the public account. There is no budget, no fiscal update. And the Prime Minister said this week that there was no spending anchor. We thought, we already thought that was the case, but now he said so openly. Can the government inform Canadians whether it knows that when we spend without any restrictions, it's future generations that are going to pay the bill? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. As I'm sure the mem member is, is aware, in the last uh, number of months, the government has engaged in many different uh, ways, uh, different levels of government, to work collaboratively with uh, a restart program, amongst many other uh, programs, to ensure that Canadians as a whole is in a much better uh, position to be able to combat the coronavirus and the impact. We're looking to the opposition, the official opposition and others, to work with collaboratively with the government so that we can continue to be there for Canadians in a very real and tangible way. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. I think the long silence we heard before the answer speaks quite loudly about the fact that the government doesn't know the answer to the question. And yet in Quebec, we got a fiscal update from the province. The government is going to run a deficit, but there is a clear goal and that there is a goal to return to fiscal balance by 2026. What does the Liberal government have to say? Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased to answer the question. I, I would say to the Honourable Member that if his house was on fire, I would tell him to save the people inside and put the fire out. The Conservative approach seems instead to be to shut off the hose over the concern of the future price of water. We entered this pandemic drama, with the healthiest drama. fiscal situation in the G7. We've used the fiscal firepower we have to help families keep food on the table and a roof over their heads. We've used that fiscal firepower to help keep the doors open of businesses and workers on the payroll. Canadians deserve to have a government that will commit to getting them through this pandemic no matter what it takes, and that is exactly what we're going to deliver. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Madam Speaker, this week the money laundering inquiry in BC said the RCMP doesn't have enough resources and officers to fight it. Dirty Money bought up billions of dollars worth of BC real estate in 2018, inflating home prices by 5%. The C.D. Howe Institute says that dirty money laundered into Canada could be over $100 billion dollars a year. The Public Safety Minister was the Minister for Organized Crime Reduction. He has known about this problem for years. So when will he finally take money laundering and fighting organized crime seriously? Minister of Public Safety. I want to thank the member for 
a great question. It gives me an opportunity to remind the member that during the last four years of the Conservative government, they slashed the, the RCMP budget by over half a billion dollars and closed all the integrated proceeds of crime units. Madam Speaker, by contrast, and it's a sharp contrast, we've invested over $172 million restoring the ability of the RCMP, FinTrack, and CRA to establish enforcement teams. We've worked in the, with, the, with the province of, of British Columbia on this matter. We've created new offences, and we are actually investing in dealing with the very serious problem of money laundering and restoring the very unfortunate cuts made by a previous Conservative government. For Lakeland. But this minister has been in power for half a decade, so he should stop blaming everyone else, stop pointing fingers, and actually do his job, because you'd think he would get the big picture here as a former police chief. It goes beyond legal casinos in B.C. China-based transnational cartels connected to the Chinese Communist Party have been operating underground casinos in B.C. and Ontario. It looks like foreign interference in Canada, money laundering to fund organized crime that is tearing Canadian families and communities apart. This is a real threat to Canada. So when will this minister actually do something to stop talking? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. The member points out that this is a problem right across Canada, and in fact, the Canada used to have 12 integrated proceeds of crime units, which were staffed by excellent and qualified RCMP officers that conducted those investigations, until the Conservatives closed all 12. We've actually begun to restore those cuts and, 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 and to replace those officers with a significant investment in the RCMP to ensure they now have the capacity to do that important work, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the member's new found interest in this, but their record speaks for itself. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Madam Speaker, Loblaws, Metro and Walmart are increasing fees to suppliers for the privilege of selling to their grocery stores. On Wednesday, the CEO of Sobeys announced that his grocery chain would not increase fees to farmers and processors. He said, and I quote, I don't think it's healthy. Some of these behaviours are just plain bad for Canada. When will this government step up like Conservatives are, call this out and side with Canadians like Sobeys is? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it's disappointing to see grocers impose these costly fees which fall on the thousands of Canadian food processors who are working hard to feed Canadians and support their communities amid many challenges. Independent grocers, food producers and processors and their workers have played a critical role during this pandemic. We share the concern of Canadians about fair market practices, and we're committed to ensuring that Canada has the right conditions for all businesses to thrive. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Madam Speaker, gouging fees by grocery giants could put farmers and processors out of business and in the middle of a pandemic, putting Canadian jobs and their food security at risk. The government should tell Canadians that they will take action now. Not tomorrow, not next week, but now. The government needs to call out this unfair competition practice like the Conservatives have. When will they show leadership for our farmers and help everyday Canadians with their grocery bills? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I assure you that we are following the, the situation very closely with my colleague, the Minister of Innovation, and also with my colleagues from the provinces. This is a very important issue that would fall under the jurisdiction of the provinces, and this is why we will facilitate the discussion, why we will be meeting many times in November to, uh, through our FPT, uh, not annual anymore, but almost weekly meetings. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable député de Rimouski Neget Temiskwata Les Basques. The Honorable Member for Rimouski Neget Temiskwata Les Basques. Madam Speaker, yesterday at the Public Accounts Committee, the Auditor General repeated that she doesn't have enough resources to scrutinize new pandemic spending. That's troubling. She stated repeatedly that she won't be able to analyze $343 billion in new spending without additional resources. This makes no sense. And yet, somehow, this seems to work well for the Liberal Party. It's happy to let the government spend billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, without being scrutinized, especially if that means that the wee scarity affair won't be looked at. The Auditor General is asking for a reasonable amount, $31 million. When will she finally get the resources she needs to do her work? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, 
I'd like to start by saying that that the President of the Treasury Board and myself are ready to support the Auditor General. Her work is very important. As the Auditor General said when she appeared before the committee, she is very pleased with the work and the collaboration between her office and the Department of Finance. We will do what we need to ensure that her office has the necessary resources. The Honorable Member, Madam Speaker, the Liberals offered an untendered contract of $900 million to their friends at We Charity, and they gave a $237 million untendered contract to Frank Bayliss, who only last year was a Liberal member in this House. How many more contracts like that are there that we just don't know about? The Auditor General is asking for $31 million to examine $343 billion in pandemic spending. Her office has asked for that five times over the last few years, have asked for a budget increase. Apart from favoring the interests of the Liberal Party, could the government tell us the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary? Madam Speaker, that's a good question. After the Harper Conservatives reduced the Auditor General's budget by $6.5 million, we took measures to, to strengthen that funding. In the 2018 budget, we invested more than $41 million in additional funding for the Office of the Auditor General. Thanks to this increase, the office added the equivalent of 38 full-time employees. Madam Speaker, as I said in my first answer, we are very pleased to see the good collaboration between the offices. Madam Speaker, the pandemic has clearly led to an increase in violence against women, both in the form of domestic abuse and human trafficking. And while Canadian women are facing these grim realities, women in unstable areas of the world face unthinkable threats to their safety and security. Unfortunately, Canada's leadership has been called into question when it comes to responding to these threats, in particular due to the lack of women peacekeepers that are available for deployment. When will the government pick up the slack and take these issues seriously. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. We know that any form of gender-based violence is not tolerated in our country, and we're going to continue to work with Canadians to end all of it in every form. Our government has made progress with the first ever federal strategy to prevent gender-based violence. That will support survivors and families. We know there's more work to be done. That's why we've committed to a national action plan to ensure that anyone facing any violence has reliable and timely access to protection and services, no matter who they are and what they live. Due to COVID-19, you've seen an additional funding of over $100 million to help women in need. And that Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. But, Madam Speaker, we're speaking about the number of women in the Canadian Armed Forces, and it's embarrassingly low, and we're nowhere near our targets of 25% of women in the Canadian Armed Forces by 2026. When women are caught in conflict zones, it is essential that women peacekeepers are there to help over compassionate and empathetic support. What is the government's plan to meet this need and show Canadian leadership in peacekeeping efforts? The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I, I um, agree with the member who raised, uh, raised the question. We do need to increase the number of women in, in, uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces. If we want to increase the number of women in peacekeeping, all of us as allies have to increase the number of women. We are working very hard to increase uh, our numbers. In fact, actually currently the current uh, commander of the NATO mission, uh, training mission in Iraq is, uh, is Janine carrying on and she's doing fabulous work, uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, and we will continue to increase our numbers and have an impact on peacekeeping operations. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, for someone who has nothing to hide, he's going a heck of a long way to cover up in the Wee scandal. He's threatened an election, he shut Parliament down for six weeks, and the latest, he's paralyzed the Finance Committee with a 25-hour, 171,000-word, one-month-long filibuster with rambly speeches that this week ventured into a Liberal MP comparing the We Scandal documents that have been blacked out to sacred texts like the Jewish Torah, the Christian Bible, and the Koran. So that presumably means that he wants to black out sections of those texts as well. 
Which ones would he like to black out? Honourable Minister, uh, Secretary, Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, Madam Speaker, you know, it's, it's interesting when the member talks about filibusters. I sat in this chamber when the member spoke for 14 hours on the budget, when he talked about the stones of the chamber and all sorts of things that were, some might say, are somewhat interesting. As much as the Conservatives want to focus their efforts and their concentration on we, who are we to say that they can't do what their priorities are? What I can tell you, Madam Speaker, is that this government's priority is to work for the health and well-being of Canadians and our economy. We're going to remain focused on the coronavirus and fighting it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. Well, a big difference, Madam Speaker, is that when the member for Carleton filibustered, it was to expose corruption. They're filibustering to hide their corruption. And this week at the Finance Committee, that display by the member for Guelph, where he likened uh, the Bible, the Torah, the Koran, and other sacred texts to their blacked out corruption documents is, is disgusting and frankly it's quite stupid. We know that for this Liberal government that, that corruption is sacred. Does the Minister... Could I ask the member to please refrain from using unparliamentary language? Thank you. Well, there are some... Does the Minister agree that this language was wrong, it was hurtful to Canadians of faith? Will he apologize to this House and to Canadians and ask the member to do the same? Yeah. Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, Ma uh, Madam Speaker. You know, in, in my times, I have heard the Conservative members uh, filibuster. And when they talk about filibusters, I think they need to, to look in the mirror. It's important for us to realize, Madam Speaker, what's taking place is a, a government that is focused on working collaboratively for those that want to work collaboratively on the number one priorities of Canadians, and that is, in fact, the coronavirus and minimizing the impact, the negative impact that it is having on our society. We would look to the Conservatives to join with us and start working collaboratively, whether it's in committee or in the House. The Honourable Member for Churchill, Kiwetan Ukaski. Madam Speaker, this week the Environment Commissioner told us that the risk assessment system for the transportation of dangerous goods is flawed with, quote, incomplete and outdated data. At the same time, the Transportation Safety Board watch list highlighted that uncontrollable movement of train incidents are on the rise. The same incidents that killed three CP workers in February of 2019 with trains carrying the same dangerous goods that blew up in Lac Megantique. This is beyond unacceptable. What these watchdogs are telling us is that the next accident is around the corner. When will the minister finally take action before he has to once more share his condolences with the families and communities affected? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We welcome the publication of the Transportation Safety Board of Canada's Watch List 2020, which provides key recommendation for the overall improvement of Canada's transportation system. We are pleased to see the Transportation Safety Board of Canada recognize the significant progress made by the Department in substantially reducing the backlog and addressing past safety recommendations, but we understand we need to do more. We share the Transportation Safety Board's commitment to advancing the safety of Canada's transportation system and takes its recommendations seriously. We will never hesitate to take the necessary actions to continuously improve safety. Member for Churchill, Kiwachinukaski. Madam Speaker, this week the Environment Commissioner's report showed that the assessment system is based on incomplete and out of date data. The next day, the uh, 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 the list showed that there is an increased number of accidents. The same incident that cost the lives of three workers in February 2019 with trains carrying the same kinds of dangerous goods that caused the accident in, in Lake Megantic. We are told that uh, we are just about to have another major accident. Uh, how can we prevent? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Transport Canada has taken concrete action in response to safety issues identified on previous watch lists, um, including implementing many measures to uh, strengthen rail safety, including implementing stricter rules to secure trains and reduce the risk of uncontrolled movement of railway equipment. We published the locomotive voice and video recorder regulation to provide accident investigators with the insight into sequence of events leading up to rail accidents. We will listen to the Transportation Safety Board and act on their uh, recommendations because rail safety is of fundamental importance to this minister and the department. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. John Rossesey. 
On October 7th, our government announced it is moving forward with its commitment to ban harmful single-use plastics as part of its plan to achieve zero plastic waste by 2030. However, for many Canadians with disabilities, plastic straws are essential for drinking. Without access to bendable, durable plastic straws, the simple act of taking a drink can become more challenging and potentially dangerous. Madam Speaker, can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change please share what steps our government is taking to ensure mm -hmm. that the needs of Canadians with this... The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank the member from uh, St. John Rothesay for his strong advocacy for Canadians with disabilities. Our government is taking ambitious action to eliminate plastic waste and pollution, including through a ban on harmful single-use uh, plastics. We will engage with Canadians with disabilities as we move forward, Madam Speaker, to ensure that their needs are reflected in our approach. We will ensure that no Canadian who needs a plastic straw for accessibility or medical reasons will go without. Madam Speaker, we will always protect our environment and advance the rights of people with disabilities. Honourable Member for Essex. Madam Speaker, there are hardships at the Canada-US border due to buck passing by the Ministers of Public Safety and Health. One example, Darren tried to cross to the USA to visit his brother. He was turned around by US Customs, yet still required to quarantine for 14 days. What followed was buck passing from public safety to health, only to learn too late to help Darren that appeals would be made to PHAC. To the Minister of Public Safety, how is it that U.S. billionaire executives clear the border while regular Canadians like Darren face nothing but chaos? Well, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm, I'm pleased to advise the member that we took very, very strong action to protect the health and safety of Canadians by imposing very significant restrictions at the Canada-U.S. border that accomplished a number of things. First of all, it allowed for the facilitation of, of the passage of trade goods, essential workers at that border. And at the same time, Madam Speaker, we, we placed severe restrictions on, on non-essential travel. Madam Speaker, we have been working um, to resolve issues where individuals, Canadians, have been impacted by those measures. Those measures are important. And it's also important, Madam Speaker, that we work with local health authorities, with our pro provincial and, and municipal partners, to ensure the health and safety of Canadians. That's what we've been doing from the outset in this, Ms. Madam Speaker. We'll continue that work. The Honourable Member for Nova West. Madam Speaker, one week ago, the new PMPRB regulations and guidelines were announced. These changes have been expected for quite some time and uh, by patients and patient groups. These groups warned that without serious revisions to the draft guidelines, new life-saving drugs like Trikafta will not be released here in Canada. Unfortunately, the proposed changes do not reflect the concerns communicated to this government. Madam Speaker, why is the Liberal government letting down patients and families once again? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Canada has amongst the highest patented medicine prices in the world, and these high prices negatively affect the ability of patients to access new medicines. In August 2019, we announced the final amendments to the patented medicine regulations. This is the first substantive update to the regulations in more than 20 years, and the member knows that new guidelines were just released about a week ago. These amendments will give the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board new tools to protect Canadians from excessive prices of patented medicines. Honourable Member for Edmonton, Grisbeck. Madam Speaker, I was talking to an Edmonton travel agent named Matthew. He is worried. His business has been devastated by the pandemic. He's desperate for help. I asked him the one thing he'd like to see this government do for his industry. He told me we need to have rapid testing for COVID widely available in Canada. It's already widely available in other countries. It'll save the travel industry. So I'm asking for Matthew, when will Canada catch up to other countries on rapid testing? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I want to thank the member for the question, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, it gives me an opportunity to tell the member that just since October 21st, 1.5 million rapid tests have been shipped around the country. Madam Speaker, Ontario, 531,924 units. Quebec, 
577,896 shipped this week. In BC, 18,576. Alberta, it go, the list goes on and on, Madam Speaker. The orders are arriving and they are... The Honourable M Member for Peace River Westlock. Mr. Speaker, the A2A Railway is a $22 billion project and would open up markets for Alberta and the Yukon. We need these jobs, not government handouts. However, these days, the Liberals seem only interested in greenlighting projects for their friends. The A2A project shouldn't have to subcontract Bayless Medical to get this Prime Minister's support. Will the Prime Minister affirm his support for this project, and on what day will we see that affirmation? Well, Madam Speaker, we know that in Canada it's time to build up and the Canada Infrastructure Bank is an important part of that plan. Our plan is creating a million jobs and bringing strong communities, building strong communities through investments in infrastructure like public transit, clean energy, broadband, affordable housing for Indigenous peoples and Northern communities alike. Our government knows that investing in infrastructure for communities, for growth, for Canadians is important. Unlike our Conservative friends whose leader in the previous government campaigned on a promise to cut $18 billion from the infrastructure program. The Honourable Member for berthier masquinoger Madam Speaker, week after week I rise in the House to ask that farmers get the compensation that Ottawa had promised them after betraying them in free trade negotiations. Week after week the Minister tells me it's coming and the weeks have turned into two years. When will the government deliver the promised compensation to dairy producers for the next few years, and when will it agree with other dairy producers about supply man under supply management? Why are they forcing them to fight for years for the money they've been promised? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Okay. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Sometimes a technology needs to be coordinated, Madam Speaker. I can assure you that our commitment is as strong with regard to supply managed producers and processors. We have committed to proceeding with a second compensation for dairy producers by the end of the year, and we will also announce how and this, this size of the uh, compensation for um, poultry producers as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for berthier masquinoger The same answers, Madam Speaker. Farm cooperatives had one good program that helped them to have access to capital to reinvest in their companies, and the program was called the Tax Deferred Program. But this program is expiring at the end of the year, and the government has refused to confirm that it would extend it, it uh, refused to confirm to the Finance Committee the cooperative movement plays a crucial role in food sovereignty. Will the government confirm today that the program will be renewed and that it will not abandon farm co-ops? People are concerned, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I can assure you that we recognize the importance of the agricultural industry to our economy in all its forms. and. It's clear that producers and farmers will be an important part of our recovery plan. I can assure you that this tax program is currently being studied. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for North Okanagan, Shushwap. Madam Speaker, this Liberal government continues to leave Canadians behind. Dairy farmers in the North Okanagan, Shushwap, and across Canada need certainty to continue to make valuable contributions to our, our economy and food security. In 2019, dairy producers were promised compensation for concessions the Liberals made in trade agreements. First-year payments were made, but no certainty has been provided for the remaining seven years, nor any details on concessions made in the Kuzma trade agreement. Why has the Minister failed to deliver certainty of support for Canadian dairy farmers? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And once again, I want to reassure my colleague and all the farmers under supply management and the processor that we still stand strong behind our uh, commitment to uh, full and fair compensation to all of them. Last summer, so, uh, we have announced one uh, billion. Seven, 
$1.75 billion for dairy farmers. The first payment has been done less than 12 months ago, and we will proceed with the second compensation this year. We will also uh, make the announcement around the compensation to poultry and eggs. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Bose. Madam Speaker, I keep saying it, Bose is the birthplace of small business, and I want specifically to talk about a small business in my riding, the Robert Carrier Garage in St. Hennedin. Despite its desire to keep its head above water during the pandemic, there's a huge obstacle. It's in a rural region, and internet is deficient. Like many other dozens of small businesses in my riding in the same situation, this business cannot expand like it wants to. Will the government wake up? and come out with a real plan to connect rural regions to rural broadband when? The Honourable Minister. Merci. Merci, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank my colleague for that important question. Of course, uh, it is clear that we need to connect all uh, places of business and residences in Quebec, including in both which we love. Uh, my colleague, the Minister for uh, rural Regents is uh, dealing with the issue. I spoke with uh, my counterpart in Quebec, and we want to cooperate with the, collaborate with the government of Quebec on these issues. Thank you. The, the Honourable Member for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. Madam Speaker, this government promised to connect rural Canadians. Earlier this year, I sent out a survey to analyze cellular service in my constituency. An alarming 92 percent of households stated that they are dissatisfied with cellular service. 92 percent, Madam Speaker. Clearly, their plan is not working. Can the minister inform the 92 percent of my constituents how to contact emergency services if they can't make a phone call? Well, uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. I, too, understand the importance of connectivity. And we understand that Canada's economic recovery depends on broadband connectivity in every household and every business across the country. Federally funded projects are supporting connections of a million households across 900 communities, including 190 Indigenous communities. Mr. Madam Speaker, it's interesting, though, in Budget 2019, the Conservatives and the NDP voted against Budget 2019, which included our connectivity program. I look forward to working with the member opposite and all members in the House to get all Canadians connected. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister of National Defence. Minister, there have been long-standing reports of a lack of support for the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces when they've had to face issues in the workplace, such as harassment. Minister, you were mandated to work to ensure that the Canadian Armed Forces have a workplace characterized by professionalism, inclusion, and a value for diversity. As part of that commitment, you were to work with the senior leaders of the Canadian Armed Forces and the defense team to establish and maintain a workplace free from harassment and discrimination. Minister, could you share with us the work that the Canadian Armed Forces is doing to establish a harassment-free environment? Minister of National Defense. Madam Speaker, I want to uh, thank the, uh, my uh, honorable colleague for that very important question. Our government takes allegations of sexual misconduct very seriously. No one should feel unsafe at work, especially in the Canadian Armed Forces. But we know that we still have a lot more work to do to eliminate these types of behaviors. And that's why we launched the Path to, to Dignity and Respect, a strategy for long-term culture change to eliminate sexual misconduct within the Canadian Armed Forces. Madam Speaker, we will not stop until all members are able to perform their duties in an environment free from harassment and discrimination. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Madam Speaker, many Royal Canadian Legions across my riding have expressed financial concerns since the outbreak of COVID. The legions continually support veterans in these difficult times. Branch number eight in Rocky Mountain House contacted the Minister of Veteran Affairs and were told that an aid package was in the works. But that was over a month ago. Madam Speaker, legions are in need of financial assistance. When will this government help legions and our veterans? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, the well-being of our veterans and their families are top priority. 
We fully understand the vital roles that Legion play in supporting the veterans and their families in all communities. That is why I'm proud to share with the House that Bill C-4 was passed in the House a few weeks ago, including $20 million to support organizations such as the Royal Canadian Legion and other partners. Our response to the pandemic is ongoing, and we will ensure that the partners, who, our partners who support veterans, will continue to have what they need to continue to do their great work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Madam Speaker, Edmonton's token funding allocation for rapid housing shows how little this Liberal government knows about the realities on the ground. Alberta is experiencing an economic downturn like we've never seen before. Homelessness is on the rise with camps forming in multiple locations, drug-related fatalities soaring and a growing mental health crisis. The situation is going to get worse with the onset of winter. Given the incredibly difficult circumstances, can the Minister explain why Edmonton received only only 3.4%, such a disproportionate low share of funds. Full Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much. I was very proud to work with Mayor Iveson on delivering these critical dollars to, to Edmonton and with Susan McGee from Homeward Trust. Part of one of the most effective uh, programs across this country at combating chronic homelessness. This funding is divided into two streams. Both streams are accessible to Edmonton, but Edmonton was given block funding to deal with some of the immediate crisis facing homelessness through the COVID crisis. They can also apply to the other stream as well. And I will remind the members that this is the first installment of many installments to come to achieve on this file. So I'd be happy to work with the member opposite to find out what properties are available for acquisition and deployment to, to, towards any chronically homelessness. And I'm very proud of the billion dollars we put on the table. The Honourable Member for Markham, Markham Unionville. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There have been 414 reported shooting just in Toronto this year. On Monday, a young man was gunned down outside the Scarborough LCBO. Five years of liberal soft on crime policies have delivered these results, but the government refuses to take responsibility. Madam Speaker, how many GTA residents need to be shot for the liberals to admit that their plans aren't working? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member opposite for a very important question. And Madam Speaker, in the last Parliament, we made significant investments, $51 million to enhance the CBSA's ability to enhance their screening, detection and training around firearms smuggling. We also invested $34 million in the RCMP's Integrated Criminal Firearms Initiative, which the member voted against. And, and Madam Speaker, the law enforcement and our border service officers are doing their job, but they need more help. And that's why we have committed in the throne speech to bring forward legislation that will give us new authorities to keep guns out of the hands of criminals by stopping the illegal smuggling, smuggling of firearms at the border in, into Canada, as well as the trafficking of firearms through diversion and straw purchasing. The new new Honourable authorities. Member new for management. Surrey Centre. Uh, Madam Speaker, Canadians from coast to coast to coast, including my riding of Surrey Centre, are rightfully excited about emerging opportunities afforded by exciting innovations in clean tech. Investments in clean tech are a win-win-win, allowing us to help the oil and gas sector grow, create good-paying jobs, middle-class jobs, and greatly reduce gr our greenhouse gas emissions. Could the Parliamentary Secretary of Innovation kindly update this House on how the government plans to invest and support this crucial industry? The Honourable Parliamentary uh, Secretary. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Surrey Centre for his important question and continued hard work. Last week, we announced a $100 million investment in the Clean Resource Innovation Network to accelerate the development and adoption of innovative technologies that lower environmental impacts. And just yesterday, the Minister for Natural Resources launched the $750 million emissions reduction fund to reduce methane and GHG emissions through greener technologies. The investments. The Honourable a Member for St. John's East. New evidence shows Westcam sensors manufactured since April, exemptions to the Turkish embargo, ended up in the Garno Karabash used by Azeri forces. Last month, Global Affairs suspended arms exports to Turkey while investigating allegations Canadian sensors were diverted to Azerbaijan. But now the evidence is clear. The Arms Trade Treaty requires Canada to prevent, detect, and stop brokering of military goods to users other than intended customers and to stop exports used against civilians. Will the minister release details? results of his own investigation and cancel all arms exports to Turkey. Parliamentary Secretary. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and I want to thank the member for St. John's East for that question. Uh, over the weeks, uh, we all know that there were allegations made regarding Canadian technology being used in the military conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, as soon as those allegations were uh, heard by the minister, he immediately directed his officials to investigate these claims. And that investigation is ongoing in line with Canada's robust export control regime. And due to the hostilities are ongoing, he suspended immediately exports that were relevant in this issue to Turkey to allow us to assess the situation. And it gives me... The Honourable Member for Nanaimo Ladysmith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This spring, a freighter dragged its anchor and collided with another ship in Plumper Sound. Two weeks ago, another freighter dragged its anchor and almost ended up on a beach in Ladysmith. Communities are fed up with the excessive noise, lights, and exhaust from these freighters and are concerned about the environmental damage they are causing. Will this government mandate improvements at the Port of Vancouver, ban the export of U.S. thermal coal, and use the 200-mile limit to control freighter traffic to, and end the use of southern Gulf Islands as a parking lot for freighters? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As the member is probably aware, the new interim protocols for Anchorage was developed in partnership with the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, the Pacific Pilotage Authority, and local communities, was, and was instituted to respond to the immediate concerns of coastal communities. The government's long-term strategy is aimed at improving the management of Anchorage's outside public ports with a view of ensuring long-term efficient and reliability of the supply chain, as well as mitigating environmental and social impacts. I want to thank the member for his advocacy on the file. And and ensure him that the well-being of coastal communities is of utmost importance for the for our government. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for question period. <laughs>